1981, um, I was the very first person, first uh, Aboriginal person, Indigenous person, um, Aboriginal person, First Nation, to address the United Nations um, in 1981. This, in 1981, it was a, an international conference of First Nations. It's the first ever put together by the United Nations. And um, the National Aboriginal Conference, I was working for them at the time, and they sent me over to this place, over to the United Nations. And this is um, 40 years later. And this is, these are the key people who were there at that very first meeting. The rest of them are dead. Yeah. And so th we were all classic, we were all considered young. So um, as you can see, this is a fellow called Cedric Jacobs. He's from Western Australia. He was the bloke that came as the elected NAC. I was to do the briefing papers for him and wrote all the, art, uh, all the papers for him to present to the United Nations. But Australia decided that I was not to go um, over there. They realised that I was a danger when I was in Canada. We were, we were going through Canada. And then they told me in Canada that um, I got a message from the embassy, in, um, the Australian embassy via Cedric that um, I had to return to Australia and I wasn't supposed to go on to the United Nations. And there's a big story about it. Anyway, as it turned out, the uh, Native American uh, Métis organisation in Canada said, well, if they're going to take you back, we'll give you the money, we'll buy your tickets, we'll give you money in your pocket. You go to the United Nations and we'll make sure that there's security following you to make sure you get to the United Nations to do what you, what you have to do. As it turned out, I flew into London and then I met by these three um, lawyers uh, from Scotland, who jumped on the aeroplane to make sure that I got to Geneva. When I got to Geneva, the Secretary of the Human Rights Commission, um, a bloke by the name William Diaz, uh, who's now passed, uh, nobody was allowed out of the plane because the United Nations security people came in with that secretary and they took me off the plane. And when we were walking out of the plane and walking down, um, going through security, when we got security, they said, see them six blokes standing around the wall here? They were all Australian security, Australian Federal Police, ready to arrest you and place you under house arrest in the Australian Embassy so that you don't go to that meeting over at the United Nations. So this is how serious it was. Yeah? And it still is pretty serious. So anyway, I'm now a member of this Elders Advisory Council to the UN on First Nations peoples around the world. Next one. And this is when I went back for that, for that one there. Um, I made sure that I took one of our young ones. And here, eh, I brought together the elders. My, mo my mother is somewhere there, there. Um, she's still alive. And these elders here, they've passed on now. But they represent, all these people here, represent the four clans in my country. And they brought with them their chosen young ones to be the Executive Council of State. And here, at this little township in Durrambandi in my country, um, we decided, that's where we decided, and the, the people all supported it, we formed and we made our unilateral declaration of independence. We announced it, we wrote it there, everybody signed it. We wrote a seven page letter to the Queen of England telling her that you've got 20 years or we'll give you, a, in a transition period, we want you to get everybody, all your people out of our country because we're taking our country back. And so that was the start of our, our my nation's uh, fight back. This is our symbol. This is the, every country has a symbol and uh, what they call a coat of arms. This is ours, this is our secret story, and this is the boomerang which protects us, we'll fight you, this is the shield also, but it also represents part of our sacred world and we don't go there. Daringi means our country, simply that. So we, we created this symbolism the same way white people accept the symbolism. Okay. Here, um, we, might, we decided in Queensland that we got land back, we're not going to pay you rates. They want to charge us rates. So they, they took me to court, and um, I then argued our case in the Supreme Court that we don't owe you money at all. This is our land, so why should I pay you as a local government rates on my country? And so in this court, when I, this was where we finished, uh, the Queensland Supreme Court, um, I wore the red headband, 
And in that I explained to the court, the judge, who I was, and I said, I am a senior person in my law, you're a senior person in your law, so it's between me and you, this argument. Yeah? And so, um, as my sister, as my, um, well, one of my cultural deputies, um, Leon, and there were other people who wasn't in the photograph, and we came out of the court, and of course the court held um, throughout all arguments, and this is quite interesting actually, the judge threw out all the arguments, dismissed all the arguments, um, and then concluded at the bottom paragraph in the decision, um, there's no one else can deal with the land transfer other than the governor of the state of Queensland, and the fight is with us, and so if there's going to be a problem here, it has to be sorted out with the governor, the queen, and the Aboriginal people. That was the end of it. And they, they still send me bills, but they don't have any legal rights to come and collect it. Queensland rights case, only the governor can make decisions on land. And that, that's the justice for Philippines. That's the concluding statement in her judgment. So, what was the other thing you said about her judgment the other day? In, in, I, I put up there, I argued that um, before the British came here, the High Court now recognises Aboriginal law and custom. And so the common law recognises it. And one of the things I said is that I said, if you know anything, and that's where I'm talking about the red Head band and I'm talking about the symbolism there, I said, we have a continental common law in this country. Yeah? And that continental common law can be found in the song lines, which connects us, all our stories, through them song lines, right around this country. That establishes what, we, what is known as continental common law. And all of the people who are at that level, who have been through ceremony, they can see those symbols, no matter where they go in this country, and they know what that means. They, they recognise it. That's the continental common law. They're the masters of that. And so when they understand that song line, and they know them stories right across this country, then nobody else can take that away from us. No. The British legal system, the High Court of Australia, can't touch it. They can't amend it in any way. And I said, this continental common law is what governs us Aboriginal people in this country, and you can't interfere with it. And then she, she said something in her judgment, <laughs> which said that um, the British didn't bring the continental common law to Australia, in her judgment. Right. I was thinking about this last night, because you told me the other day about this. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the definition of treaties under the UN Treaty Convention. Yeah. It seems fairly clear, if you take that statement from her in written form and sign off it on an agreement, that it qualifies under international law as a treaty. Oh, okay. Isn't that something? I, I've got a plan in that straight away. You can do I've it with that straight away. You can do it with <laughs> right. yeah. Marbo as well. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Okay, so... There is a thing in law that um, when we're resisting and we're fighting a, a, um, a rebellion against our oppressors and our occupiers, one of the things that has to be established if you're arguing in the Western world is you have to show that the resistance started right at the beginning. You know, so what do they call it? The critical time. I think that's, that's the key thing. So when was the critical time in our history when we said to them, white people, you're not allowed here. You in, you're not allowed on our country. So when was our critical time? Honestly, the critical time was when they say that that black fellow threw a spear at Cook and he shot back at, at the black fellows with the muskets and drove them off into the bush. So when they say, when was the critical time that we can demonstrate that we resisted Britain's invasion of our country, that's the time. And so it happened before they even set foot on this soil. They were in their boat, in their, what do they call them, little boats that they get coming on, and that's where they shot that man at Bear there. Island. Hey? Bear Island. Bear Island, that's it. They shot him there. And Which island was they called? Bear Island? Bear Island. Bear Island. Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. Those, an old man and a young fellow were standing on the shore as Captain Cook came into Botany Bay. The other had him shut away. And she came and speared at him. And uh, their response was to um, first fire muskets. And they scattered a bit and then came back. And then when they let the cannon go, that's when they, they dropped into the bushes. Yeah. And what was that? 
Yeah. But so, so this moment of resistance shows that we resisted before they even set foot on the soil. And that is the critical time in history that gives us authority to fight back. And of course, ever since then, our mob just continued to resist them all over this country. Yeah. See, I was like the fellows, we didn't let him in. No. <laughs> no. <Nope. See>? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Here, by the way. Even in the former negotiation, they still didn't want to negotiate. That was by the, the taking of the Milleroy Shield. Because even when we did approach them on the beach of Botany Bay, mm. what was the first thing they did? Yeah. They, they shot. Yeah, they shot. Here. So they didn't want a former negotiation? No. But there was no intentions. No. Here. This is interesting. I think they were very afraid. That was defensive. Yeah. They were very defensive people. Here. Yeah. This, this is a carry-on of the type of uh, things that they did against us. In, in Sydney, um, there's a lot of records that shows that they found smallpox. Uh, Aboriginal people riddled with smallpox. As it turns out, we now have evidence that they bought a, uh, a rotten um, arm of a person from England, wrapped in a blanket, covered with smallpox, and they did the same thing in Canada, and then they wrapped that thing up and they kept rubbing that all over the blankets when they give the blankets out to the blackfellas. And when they give that blanket out to the blackfellas, this was the net result, and they found them dead all over the rocks around Sydney. Yeah, so they. They carried out a disease, a, a, a chemical warfare against us right from the beginning. Same as Canada. Yep. This is all the battles. These are represented in Bathurst and Victoria and on the Murray River, on the, um, up in my country. It's the same thing. It's just a constant replication of our people fighting back and getting slaughtered by their guns. Yep. Okay. This is a case. This is a court case in... Um, in the uh, New South Wales uh, court, because there was only New South Wales at the time. And this was a bloke called Murrell and uh, Bunbury in 1836. And um, they argued uh, before this bloke, Chief Justice Dowling and uh, Justice Burton, in, on the February, um, and this is written, this story was written and reported by the Sydney Gazette. That was the first, very, very first Gazette, because one of the things when they set up a um, the colony, they had to set up a gazette, they, a notice that they could give to the public. And the gazette basically is where the government has to push all their information out and tell them the laws and the rules, and they have to gazette it. Well, and you've if, been fighting for this to be recognised. Yes. Now we know under the law of treaties, yeah. all you need to do is find the document mm. where that judgment was rendered, sign it, yeah. and it's a treaty under UN law. That's true. There, there's, a, there's a couple of other judgments. Judgments I want to show you. I'm yeah. going to show you. Okay, so Murrell and Bummery. Is that right now? Eh? Right, at this right now. Right now, yeah. Is that all it takes, really? Yes, and you can like, take a number of documents, sign right. them off, and put them together in a binder and say yeah. that's the treaty. That's the treaty. And get them all signed. Yeah. You sign them because they've already issued it as a judgment. Yeah. So it's an official judgment from them. Yeah. Now, here, yeah, we, we will pursue this when he <coughs> talks about treaty. Um, when Gary talks about treaty. This is what was said, and, they, and this judge quoted this in his judgment. It was laid down in Blackstone's uh, 102, and in fact, in every other work on the subject, that land obtained like the present were not, um, were not desert or uncultivated. Desert, that's how they used to spell it, desert, you know, free of people, yeah? um, or uncultivated or people from a mother country. They have originally, they have, they having, ori having originally a population of their own, more numerous than those who have since arrived from the mother country. So they acknowledge that we had greater numbers on, in Australia. Neither could this, ter this territory be called a conquered country as Great Britain, as was, uh, Great Britain never was at war with the natives. No, that's not true. It was not a ceded country either. In, it in fact came within the, with neither, neither of these, but was a country which had a population having manners and customs of their own. And we had come to reside amongst them, therefore, in point of strictness and allergy to our law, we are bound to obey their laws and not they obey ours. Yeah? Now that 
is an admission by a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales at the time, the highest court in the land in this country. Nobody in the legal fraternity in this country Forbes today... Did that? Yeah, Chief Justice so Forbes. And, and, it, and it was agreed to by Justice Dowling. Was that written by Wentworth Law? No, that was written... No, that's the actual article, because when you say Sydney Gazette, Wentworth Law... Well, we, we, we don't know who, who, who wrote that's it. That's how they reported But that's how they reported courts. Yeah, this is how they reported courts. And so this is vital for us blackfellas. We don't realise how important that decision is. If you think Mar Marbo gave us native title and was a very groundbreaking decision, this was the very first Marbo. There's another one that's going to happen. I'll show you. Yep. Right. Um, so, one more. There. And this is another court case later in the Supreme Court of New South Wales in 1841. And this Justice Willis, he said this, I repeat that I am not aware of any express enactments or treaties subjecting Aborigines of this colony to the English colonial law. And I have shown that the Aborigines cannot be considered as foreigners in a kingdom which is their own. And then he, Justice Willis, then re he, this was his reasoning later. Aboriginal people remain unconquered and free, entitled to be regarded as self-governing communities. Their right as distinct people could not be considered to have been tacitly surrendered, as they were by no means devoid of legal capacity, and had laws and usages of their own. Treaties should be made with them. The colonialists were uninvited intruders, the Aborigines, the native sovereigns of the soil. Right? Now, you can't get any higher than that. There's no court in this country, even Marble, that overturned this judgment. No one. I think you can get a copy of the original document of this from Macquarie University. Yes, you database. can. Yes. Yeah. This is very telling. This is why blackfellas in this country don't have to obey anything that they tell us. Yeah? We are our own masters. Do you know how, this, how dangerous this is? If a whole lot of white people wanted to become Aboriginals and get initiated and whatever, yeah. They are doing it. They're doing it. They're doing it. Then they're not subject to the white laws anymore. That's right. You know, a lot of that, well, for myself, I'd like to go down that path, but simply not for any gain, but, well, the gain is to be connected. Yeah, many people are doing yeah. it. And yeah. They know something. Yeah, that's right. So this is, this is vital, this year. And, and so I can't emphasise to you um, how powerful this is. And the problem we got is that not enough of our mob know how to make this act work. And this is the whole purpose of educating you, telling you about this here, so that you go back home and start putting things into place. And if you don't know and you need assistance, we will come out there and we will help you put this governance in place and you start telling them, get out of our country. Yeah. Well, new terrorism laws will not apply to us. They will try and apply them to us, um, but they, they, they will not stand up in any court. What laws? The terrorist laws, terrorism laws, yeah. So they, they may try to exercise, you know, that, but the thing is that we're not subject to those laws. Because I can see, like, people standing up and the first thing that they want to accuse them of is being... Look, I, 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 when, when I was talking about this amongst my mob, yeah, um, I, walking through the township of Dubbo, the city of Dubbo, out central west, where all my mob sort of does the big town where we go from out of the bush. I'm walking along and this old black fellow is singing out to me and, he, and he, I could hear his voice and I thought, oh shit, here I go. Um, and he's a very, very prominent Aboriginal man. And he, come over here, mate, sit down there and have a cup of tea with me, I want to talk to you. So there were a couple of old fellows with him. And I sat down and they, he said, I just worked out what you're doing. Because <laughs> he, he, he was a wolf, this old fellow. And he, he became a very well-known Aboriginal person because he became the first Aboriginal communist and he became the first Aboriginal person the security, Australian security, started following and watching um, the ASIO people now, the spies, they started spying on him because he got involved in, the, in, in communism. 
And he's sitting there and then he said, I just worked out what you've done and what you're doing. He said, I want you to be very careful. He said, make me a promise. I said, why? What, what's the promise? He said, you just worked out that all the prison doors should be open and everybody should be released immediately because they don't have any legal powers to hold them behind bars. He said, and because he's, he's older than my mum, he said, son, he said, I know culturally you're my boss, you're senior to me, but this political way, he said, I just want to say this to you. There's people in those jails we don't want out of jails. Our own people don't want them out of jail. So can you promise me to keep your mouth shut for a while until we work out what we're going to do with them? Because if they come out, we have to have people there at the door and put a spear straight through them and kill them. We can't let them walk amongst your arm. Yeah? So he said, think about what you're doing first. And he said, and then when you've got, when you've got all them mob ready, then mob ready, they'd be up that gate there and they'd kill that fellow. And I know, I know four people that if they let out amongst my mob, my mob's just going to kill them. They're safer in jail than they are outside. Because my mob will kill them according to our law. So, that, so there's some serious business. There's a lot of repercussions here, yeah? And I can walk into a white man's court any day, as I've done, and I've got people walked them out of court because there's no jurisdiction. But I can't keep doing that. I have to be very careful of what I do. Yeah? And crimes against humanity. Australia are shitting themselves, and so are Britain. Because, you see, they know we're coming. They know we're coming for justice. They know we're getting ready. They know we're getting educated. Yeah? And they are not prepared. And I will show you a document later on to show you why White Australia are not prepared and how they are scared. They know what's coming. This is a funny one. Yeah? Look, they got all this here after Australia Day. Um, the cleaning, clean up begins. And then that black fellow there saying, we should have sent this mob off to Christmas Island for processing while we still had a chance. Yeah, so, yeah. next one. Here is the mortality rate amongst our people. This shows genocide. This is the proof that genocide is occurring. This is the death rate of black fellows. That's the death rate of white fellows in this country. So when you look at that, it's shocking. And that's the data that was 2007-2011. So it's just giving you a demonstration of what genocide looks like. Yeah. Like, in the Constitution, like how they're trying to recognise mm. us as yeah. citizens, again, we want to do that, but they don't recognise genocide. No, they don't. They, the, the state is that they want to recognise us in the constitution, yeah, but they don't recognise what they're doing to us. Yeah. So it's a you know a bit of a contradiction, and, and of course it, you know it's, it's it's wrong. But th this is showing the physical death, by the way. What this is not showing are other aspects of, of genocide. And the other aspects of genocide is when they take our kids from us and put them with someone else. When they take our language and we don't talk our language. When they deny us a national identity, our own heritage, that's genocide. Transmigration. And trans yeah, and forced, trans forced transmigration. Yeah. When they move people from one area of their country and move them into another, that's genocide as well. And that's not reflected here. Okay. Um, this is the children in jail. Yeah, uh, disproportionate incarceration of our youth. As you can see here, um, in Australia, so you've got this here, these are our kids, that's uh, Australia, the general thing, that's kids in jail, white kids, that's black kids in jail. Western Australia, that's white kids in jail, that's black girls in jail, black kids in jail. In America, that's white and that's black. So you're showing, you know, that we are under attack. We're at war and we don't even know that they're operating the rules of war against us. And Gary, um, if I can, just ask you, can you quote that section of the Australian Constitution that makes the police in each state a military force? 
Section 51 of the Constitution has many different, what they call, placetums of power. Placetum means like a table, a placetum of power. And these are called concurrent powers. They didn't take the power away entirely from the state governments when they formed the Commonwealth. Mm. So all the placeta of power within Section 51 are called concurrent powers. An example would be the corporate powers of both the states and the Commonwealth have power over corporations. But the key one that Michael's referring to here is the defence power. Now the defence power could have been outside Section 51, but they put it in Section 51, indicating that not only does the Commonwealth have the right of defence of that Army, Navy and Air Force, but so do the states. So I conferred with a friend of mine who's a colonel in the Australian Army, and he agreed with me that some, of, some percentage of state police actions are de facto uh, uh, war activities against certain sectors, sections of the population. And we agree that the states have the power to use a military to enact war. So, under the English common law, there's a maxim, and the maxim is the top level of discerning their common law, and it says a man is, a man means man or woman, but in the days they wrote it, it probably only meant man. A man is taken to have intended the natural consequences of his actions. So their actions and the way they've set things up have a natural consequence that Michael has shown with the several slides and the graphs. So you can infer validly from their common law that they intended that. Yeah. It's intentional. Yeah. And can I just say this? Um, in 1970, 1970, New South Wales introduced a group called the 21 Division of Police. And they gave them military powers. Yeah? And um, when us young black power fighters, we used to all congregate in a pub in Redfern called the Empress Hotel. And then all of a sudden, as, a tra as part of a training exercise for this 21 Division to smash um, um, state opposition, and this was a police force, and this is the military side of the New South Wales police force, um, they set the 21 Division up, and then one night we are all in the pub, big mob, band playing, blackfellas, we all dancing, charging on. And then all of a sudden all the lights in the pub went out, and there's only one alleyway you used to go to the back to where all we all our black used to be. And that all when the lights went out, all these fellas come in with big boots on and God knows what else. And when they came in, then all of a sudden um, we felt ourselves being kicked and punched and God knows what else and battened, used. And then you know there were people laying everywhere, blood split open and everything. And then when they turned the lights on. They, would, they had all these policemen outside and all the police wagons, the streets were blocked off and they had police wagons and they were just dragging black out and throwing us into the, into the wagons. And we, we thought, okay, they're going to do this again. So then everybody was prepared, we put up a code and once those lights went out we knew what to do and then we smashed every bloody copper who came into that place the, the next time. And uh, so they were dragging them out and calling ambulances, um, so we'd give it back to them. And, um, and they couldn't do anything about it because, you know, we were defending ourselves and they were turning off the lights. And nobody ever went to court over that. Nobody. Why were they also flying 21 squad to protect their own within New South Wales? Yeah. Remember any of the magistrates got in trouble? Yeah. When they were out on the town, like, you know, they got caught in the wrong position with the wrong person. Yeah. They called it the flying 21 mm -hmm. squad. They bolt over there, seize all the witnesses, seize all the evidence, seize the police. Pick up that magistrate, put him in the back of the car, slap him on the wrist and tell him to go home. Yeah. Alright, so, so the next, next slide, what we're going to do is, um, uh, just looking at the time. So in the face of government's agenda to assimilate, we still have, uh, these are the sort of things, treaty um, and uh, reconciliation, and what's that sovereignty? So these two things here now are, are government active, active programs to try and squash this to try and squash our sovereignty movement. That's what they're doing. Okay, so the, I, I've got more there to finish because it's very important because it's gonna show you what, what, we're, what we're doing and how it's working so you're fully informed. 
Um, we'll break now for a cup of tea and have a stretch. And then after this, after when we come back, we're going to have um, uh, Ruthie Gilbert. She's going to present the Kevin Gilbert Memorial Lecture. It's the very first time it's happened. And um, it's, uh, yeah, you, you're going to be honoured by the fact that this is the first time we're doing this. Okay, thank you. And then we'll get back into business.